Blog Talk Radio. This is an ABC News special report. Now reporting, George Stephanopoulos. Good afternoon. We're coming on the air right now with some sad news. Mary Tyler Moore has passed away at the age of 80. You remember her, the iconic TV actress, starred in the Dick Van Dyke Show in the 1960s. Then her own show, the Mary Tyler Moore Show, from 1970 to 77. Of course, both programs have lived on in reruns to this day, reaching new generations of viewers. She played Mary Richards, an independent single woman working as a TV journalist in Minneapolis. It was an inspiration for millions of women everywhere. And our Chris Connolly has more on her life and times. Among the most beloved actresses in television history, Mary Tyler Moore transformed TV's portrayal of single working women in the 1970s. Associate producer, can you believe that? As local news producer Mary Richards on The Mary Tyler Moore Show, she got laughs by being good at her job. You got spunk. (laughs) Well, Coping with the outsized ego, ambition, and insecurities of her endlessly addled co-workers. The show also gave its heroine a rich personal life, but never let a boyfriend commandeer her. Now, how come I never noticed that before? Wait, that I love you? But you don't say that very well. She'd be fully herself with her female pal. Mary Richards would be a role model for a generation entering the workforce, winning four Emmys during the show's seven-season run. Mary Tyler Moore. Moore wasn't that hip or edgy, but was regarded among Hollywood's best ones. Her many skills were first on display in the 1960s as Laura Petrie, wife to TV writer Rob Petrie, on the popular sitcom The Dick Van Dyke Show. On the big screen, she played a nun opposite Elvis Presley in Change of Habit. I wish there were an easy answer. Let's try to find a way, Michelle. That same year, 1969, she and then-husband Grant Tinker formed MTM Enterprises, which would produce such top series as Hill Street Blues. After the Mary Tyler Moore Show, she'd do a variety show. 1978's Mary had a supporting cast that included Michael Keaton and David Letterman. Then Robert Redford would cast her as a suburban mother dealing with the loss of one son and the anguish of another in ordinary people. What you think I've done, you blame me for the whole thing. But can't you see anything except in terms of how it affects you? No, I can't, and neither can you, and neither can anybody else. She'd be nominated for an Oscar. The film won Best Picture. But during that time, Moore's only child, Richard, would die of a gunshot wound. My only regret in life of things that I could have done differently um, is that I, I didn't have more children. I lost my son 14 years ago. And um, I don't have and will not have grandchildren, and I miss them. Diagnosed with type 1 diabetes, she was longtime chairman of JDRF, a foundation to support research into juvenile diabetes, a powerful advocate testifying to Congress on behalf of those afflicted. She is survived by her third husband, Dr. Robert Levine. Thank you for being my family. By scores of devoted and admiring co-stars and colleagues, and by millions more who found laughter and a special kind of connection with Mary Tyler Moore's kind, clever, and indomitable self, preserved forever on the show that made her an icon and a lasting influence on American life. You might just... All felt like we knew her. And a good evening, everyone, and welcome to the King Jordan Radio Show. The date is Thursday, January 26, 2017. This is Season 5, Episode 19. Remember, next week we are joined with former attorney for Jody Arias. Kirk Nurmi will be here. Uh, tonight's guest is, well, uh, all you trial watchers that are uh, listening, you definitely um, tuned in at 7 Eastern on the HLN network when such cases as Casey Anthony, Dr. Murray, uh, Jody Arias were on. It was 
Must See TV with our guest. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome now with JaneUnchained.com. The legendary Jane Velez Mitchell joins us here tonight. Jane, good evening. <laughs> How are you? Hello. I'm legendary now? Wow. Better than you sure I guess. Are. <laughs> With everything you covered, I mean, uh, what what was the most rewarding case you covered on that uh, that program that you covered for so many years? Oh, uh, well, issues you know, with Jane. I, I, yeah, uh, I would have to say it was even before that. It was probably the story that got me the job because when I was covering the Michael Jackson child molestation trial, yes. I started filling in for Nancy Grace after our show, Celebrity Justice, ended. And uh, I would have to say the Michael Jackson trial was, you know, when, when things flash before your eyes at the end of your life, that's going to flash. Yes. Because that was the craziest trial. Uh, I mean, sure, O.J. Simpson trial was crazy, and the Jody Arias trial was crazy, and the Casey Anthony case was crazy, but... Michael Jackson trial was on a whole different level. <laughs> but crazy. I got to tell you, uh, Tom Mesero is a uh, regular <clears throat> here, and he does oh, really? compliment you in terms of in terms oh. of the way you carry yourself during the case. Uh, as you probably know, there were a lot of uh, journalists that went in one direction, um, and in your line of work, uh, we like to see unbiased and. Uh, Tom said that he thought that was you uh, of all time. Oh. Well, I have to say that I'm a big fan of Tom Mazzaro's. I always say if I'm ever in big trouble, there's one number yes. I'm going to call. That's Tom Mazzaro's. I kept it in my cell phone. Hopefully he has to say, well, hopefully I'll never be in that kind of trouble. But he is the most brilliant attorney. I mean, <clears throat> when he showed up for that trial with his long, flowing white hair, looking like something, yes. you know, one of the founding fathers. Very old school. And, and he, he was up against Tom Smedden, who was the DA, you know, and very cocky and acting like he had already won the case. And uh, right. Tom was just very nose to the ground. And I would see him jogging around town because we all lived in Santa Maria for like months. And he was just very quiet, methodical, and he just ripped that case apart. And wow, but it was very heated. There were reporters who couldn't sit next to each other at dinner because there was a whole pro-prosecution flanks of um, uh, reporters and then some who felt he was innocent. And uh, I you know, would go back and forth. That was, that was the thing is that you couldn't really – he was such an enigmatic person. You couldn't really figure out like – Wow. You know, I do feel he had issues, <laughs> speaking of issues, but I don't sure. know if the particular case that Tom Snedden brought was the one that Strong. was the good case. Because those, the and family I think when had you problems. Were covering, they try to shake down. Yeah. Yeah. When you were covering, Michael, uh, for Dr. Murray, <clears throat> and when you heard him all drugged out, and he was talking um, about the hospital, I believe it was you that said, you know, when you're under the influence of stuff, that's the real you talking. So you kind of... Well, in vino veritas kinda, is what they say. But but also, I think that when you think about incomprehensible behavior that people do, uh, quite often mm-hmm. there's drugs, uh, either mental illness or drugs at the heart of it. So um, <clears throat> I, I do feel like he had serious problems. But again, um, he was acquitted and... Uh, uh, he walked out of that court a uh, free man. Let's face it, though. Every, anybody that's quote unquote <clears throat> genius always had their issues. Elvis Presley, you know, uh, tons of kids that have grown up on sitcoms, Dana Plata. I mean, stardom does something to you, I believe, if you start most uh, in most situations. Um, yeah. And let's face sure. it, top five. Yeah. So the. You know, there, there was this during while there's a little thing. noise behind me. You know, I keep covering uh, stories, but now I focus entirely on animal rights. I'm here at the, the San Fernando Valley. There's a planning commission meeting, and they want to try to close uh, a beautiful rescue that rescues hundreds of animals a year on a zoning veter- on a zoning uh, variant. And there's hundreds of people mm-hmm. here uh, demanding that they um, keep this facility open and. Uh, I'm I'm covering it. I was going live for Jane Unchained, and you can watch me at uh, facebookcom slash Mitchell. So I I hope you keep up with what I'm doing now because um, what's happening to animals in this country is a crime. So if you like crime, 
stories, um, you can you can definitely become an animal activist because what's happening to animals in America and around the world is is a crime. And you're a, ve- a vegan also, right? Oh yeah. If you love animals, I say don't eat them, don't wear them, uh, don't buy <laughs> products that are experimented on. Uh, it's very easy, did, and you know what? You'll live longer and you'll be happier. I did want to get your take on Mary Tyler Moore, who passed away suddenly <clears throat> uh, yesterday uh, afternoon. Uh, did you follow her at all? Well, what's really funny was my second job out of college, my first job was in Fort Myers, Florida, where I was a reporter and anchor, and my second job was in Minneapolis, which is where she was a TV reporter or producer or something, but she was uh, on television or in television in Minneapolis. And I remember I was offered the job over the phone, and I thought of Mary Tyler Moore spinning her tam into the air, you know, her beret, and I thought, sure, I'll take that. And I got on a plane and went to Minneapolis, and I went from Florida. This was in the 70s, mind you. All I had were mini mm-hmm. skirts, high heels, and, like, cut-off <laughs> tops because it was the disco <laughs> era. And I landed in 45 degree below zero weather. Total culture wow. shock. I couldn't start I my imagine. car because it was freezing. It was in the middle of winter. I, I moved into, now it's the hippest part of Minneapolis, Mooring Park, but at the time it was very bad neighborhood. I thought it was charming. I moved in there. I couldn't start my car in the morning. There were people passed out on the stoop when I woke up and I was like completely could not function. I'm a city girl. I was born in Manhattan and uh, I just couldn't function. I, they would say, send me on a story and they'd say, take frontage road. And I thought that was like, I was like, this guy frontage must've been very important. His name is everywhere. Well, it turns out every road has a side road called the frontage road, which I didn't know. And I would end up in crazy places like Wisconsin. I would get lost. I mean, it was, it was a nightmare. Uh-huh. I don't know how I survived for two years. Drinking heavily, I think, because at the time I was a practicing alcoholic. Now I'm going to be 22 years sober in April. But, um, yeah, it was, it was a rough couple of years in Minneapolis. <laughs> 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 but that's my Mary Tyler Moore story, Okay. I, I loved her. She was a, she was an icon, and you know people think it's easy being a star on TV. Um, you, you have to be so on the ball to be an actress. It's one of the hardest jobs on the planet. Uh, I couldn't be an actress for five seconds, and um, you know really? great actresses like Mary Tyler Moore made it look so easy. She made it look easy, but it's not easy. No, it's not right. easy. I was talking to somebody who was on uh, Madam Secretary. Uh, and I said, oh, I saw you on Madam Secretary. You did a great job. She goes, thank you. And she said, you know, you have to be – I said, is it a lot of fun? Is it, no, it's serious business. I mean, she, she said she had a great time, but it's serious business. You have to know your lines, and you have to – if you move your hair, you know. She was describing, like, it's, it's, like, unbelievable how planned it is. You put your cup of coffee down at a certain time, and then you move yourself, you know. It's, it's a choreography that's very, very complicated. It's not just memorizing words. And um, right. I have a lot of respect for actors. They, and they also have to become vulnerable. They have to open themselves up and let people see inside their feelings and their insecurities. I, I mean, it's just very difficult, very difficult. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, you, if you remember the uh, show uh, One Day at a Time that's seen on uh, replays here, um, Mackenzie Phillips, I believe her name mm-hmm. was, um, oh, yeah. did a lot I've of drugs her a during times. the show. Yes, and I don't know if you heard the allegation in her book that of her father. Uh, yeah. yeah. So that's said yeah. either way. We had her on. I, the, I interviewed her several times. She's very cool. Very cool lady. Yeah. Yeah. Very cool indeed. And but uh, Mary Tyler Moore, you know, a little before my time, but definitely an icon from everybody uh, I uh, heard from. Larry King, uh, you know, knew her, and I spoke to him recently. Uh, and uh, praised her, praised her. Uh, nobody really had nothing bad to say. Uh, the well, that's the other I thing. Going that, uh, through an entire career without a scandal, that's amazing. Because remember her uh, co-star, right, had had his share of scandal. I think it was whatever. He drank too much or whatever. I'm not sure. I, I, I don't want to speak out of school. Yeah, I think that was pretty well known. Okay. But please correct me if I'm wrong. Um, <laughs> no, I wouldn't know. <laughs> because, <laughs> yeah. I, but, you know, um, it, to get through a whole career on TV without some kind of scandal um, as an actress, That's it's, amazing. it's a pretty big accomplishment. Yeah, huge. 
I would say so, yes. Okay, I wanted to get uh, this, uh, the uh, Ring Ring Brothers and uh, Barnum and Barely. I want to play this cut for the audience so they know what the story is, and then I want to get your take on the other side. The greatest show on earth will soon take its final bow. This show in Orlando is the last time the staff, the entertainers, the jugglers, and clowns shoot up and perform before the announcement that the longest-running circus in history will shut down after 146 years. We will be closing both units of Ringling Brothers Farm Belly Circus in May of this year. The famous Ringling Brothers partnered with Barnum and Bailey in 1919, and the Three Ring Circus hasn't stopped dazzling crowds with death-defying stunts and exotic animals changing with the times. It's been through world wars, it's been through every kind of economic cycle, and it's been through a lot of change. The circus is an amazing chapter of American culture. Scott O'Donnell is the executive director of the Circus World Museum in Baraboo, Wisconsin. Home of the Ringling Brothers, original headquarters. No other entertainment art form has affected American culture like the circus has. In its heyday, the circus, when it came to town, schools closed, businesses were let out. It was like a national holiday because the circus was here. But organizers say the show doesn't have the same appeal and draw that it once had. It isn't relevant to people in the same way. Circus officials say the public opinion of wild animals in captivity slowly choked attendance. After years of fighting animal rights groups in court and facing organized protests, the circus chose to remove all of their elephants from the show in 2016, placing them in a preserve. Removing the elephants from the touring units, we saw a very sharp drop in attendance much greater than we anticipated and that's led us to this decision because the business model is no longer sustainable. Two touring groups of 462 employees will continue performing until May. The final shows are scheduled to be in Providence, Rhode Island and Uniondale, New York. But historians say the spirit of the circus will never die. There will always be institutions such as this that honor that heritage. It made us dream. It made us sit in wide-eyed wonder. Uh, it made us all be kids again. Soon, this place of wonder will only be a memory for the children of all ages. Joshua Plogel, The Associated Press, Orlando. Okay, Jane, uh, this is something that you actually went down to Ringling Brothers and been fighting for. Uh, so what did you take away uh, this uh, uh, spring? Hallelujah. Uh... Hallelujah. Okay, <laughs> wild animals do not sit on balls and uh, jump through hoops unless they've been broken and uh, abused. And all you have to do, don't take my word for it, go on YouTube and uh, Google Ringling Brothers PETA footage undercover of them being hit. And they didn't choose you know, this is typical of reporting that is just so biased against animals and doesn't consider the animal side of the story. Um, and it's just basically sounds like a show for, for the circus. Uh, that that <laughs> report that I just listened to, you know, fill with drenched sentimentality. Oh, well, why don't we all go back to chastity belts? We used to wear those too. Um, so, right. you know, the idea is that the reason that they were put out of business, they didn't volunteer to take their elephants out. They fought it tooth and nail. But it was the strategic thinking of people for the ethical treatment of animals, PETA. They were the ones that started to uh, push for bullhook bans in selected cities. It started in Atlanta, then it went to Los Angeles, then it went to Oakland, and then it spread all across the country. And they had to take elephants off of the circus because without those bullhooks that they beat them with, they couldn't control the elephants. So that is proof in itself. You don't have the bull hook, which is a weapon to um, control these animals. You can't have them because they don't want to be there. They're prisoners. So strategically, PETA did something absolutely brilliant. They said, let's get the bull hooks banned. And once they're deprived of their bull hooks, they can't um, have the elephants anymore because the elephants don't want to be there. They're not going to they're not going to sit around and, and stand on their hind legs without those bull hooks that they're terrified of. And without the elephants, the circus is no more because that's their signature animal. So um, 
in truth, there are plenty of circuses that involve just human beings that have the choice to decide whether they want to be in the circus, which animals do not have. You know, not many people can say that their parent was in the circus. My mother was actually in the circus. And she, really? Uh, um, yes. And she died at 99 and a half, a year, year and a half ago. She was also the last of the vaudeville oh. performers who played the Palace Theater. And she said that she, she was just devastated, those elephants. She saw those elephants, and she would tell me this years ago, that as, as a person of compassion, she just, her heart went out to those poor elephants and the other wild animals in the circus. So we've got Cirque du Soleil. The circus isn't gone. It's not over. You can go see people performing circus acts, people who are going to get paid, which the animals are. Cirque du Soleil. And as far as that yep. sanctuary I'd like to see that all these elephants retire to a real sanctuary, a sanctuary which is not there for them to be used for experiments or to cancer testing or any of the other things that they've decided. Why can't these animals just exist in their own right? Why do they always have to be used somehow as factotums or products or in some way utilized? Don't they have a right to their own lives? Absolutely. What would you like to see, you know, that Ringling Brothers that's going to close down this spring? What would Jane is like the next big thing? The next, well, you know, uh, let horses me just put it is this a big way. stretch. That's a big stretch. No, let me, let me tell you what it has to be. It has to be sure. what we eat. Because you can care about wild animals. You can care about dogs and cats, and I have three rescue dogs at home and cats, and I just testified at a hearing here in the Los Angeles Valley to keep a rescue open. But the vast majority of animals that are being brutalized in this world are factory farm animals, cows, pigs, chickens, turkeys. Um, You know, pigs have a higher IQ than dogs. They're kept in crates the size of their bodies, never able to turn around. They're castrated without anesthesia. Their tails are cut off. I mean, what they do... Any of that to a dog, you would be charged with animal cruelty and thrown in jail. And yet, these animals have no legal protections. So I say to people, and I I beg you to realize that peace begins on your plate. You know, I had a woman who showed up from the United Nations once back when I had my show, and she wanted to talk to me about some project. She arrived early at the restaurant, and she had already ordered when I arrived there. And she's telling me all about peace and her work for peace, and then her her meal arrives, and it's um, some kind of lamb, swimming in blood, rare. Oh, my said, God. Excuse me, excuse <laughs> me. I have a, a little problem with you talking about peace, and there's blood swimming on your plate. And she just didn't know what to say about that. But the truth is, look in the mirror. Um, you know, these animals did not come to be by making love. They are violated. You know, they are. Right. Um, they are here's, here's the thing, crime, right? I covered crime for years. Factory farming yes. is a rape, abduction, and murder operation. They rape the animals to impregnate them. Then they abduct their babies, and then they kill them all, the babies and the mommies. And, you know, for us to drink cow's milk, a baby calf has to be taken away from his mother so that he can't get that milk, and he's stuck in a crate to be turned into veal. I had my mother for 60 years, and I still cry every day that I lost my mom a year and a half ago. These animals... Wow quite often don't have their mothers for 60 seconds. Think of that. If you think you're a good person, look in the mirror and ask yourself, did I co-sign a hit on that animal? You know, I've covered crime for years. You don't have to pull the trigger to be charged with murder. If you conspire with somebody, if you tell somebody, go, I'm going to pay you to go kill, kill my husband, you are charged with murder. Well, it's the same thing. You're, the consumer is the reason why all these animals are being tortured and killed. So I just urge everybody... You don't need to eat them. Processed meat is cancer-causing. That's official. It, the leading cause of heart disease can be reversed and prevented with a plant-based diet. Eat your fruits, vegetables, nuts, and grains. There's great alternatives. There's, there's vegan cheeses. There's vegan bacon. There's vegan everything these days, and it's in every supermarket. Check it out. Jane, what inspired you to be on uh... – <laughs> How can I say it? Uh, what inspired you to do what you're doing with in, in terms of with the animals? And uh, obviously, there's no faking. You know, you were at this hardcore 24 seven. I could tell. When did this come about? Like this passion? I know you always loved animals, but 
when with this like uh, mentality, like uh, this strong mentality, if you will, uh, that, that what triggered this that that you really wanted to get into this? Well, I've always loved animals, and I grew up in a kind of pescatarian household. My mother, the same one who was in the circus, uh, uh, she was from Puerto Rico. She was very advanced in her thinking. She was doing yoga in the 40s when nobody knew what yoga was. Um, she was into macrobiotics. My dad was Irish. He adopted a, a pescatarian diet when he met her. We thought of ourselves as vegetarians, but we weren't. We still ate fish and eggs and milk. And then as I grew up and I became a journalist and I started to, to research um, issues and I came across factory farming. At first, I couldn't believe it. I said, no, this can't be true. Nobody would do this. You'd have to be a sociopath to keep pigs in crates the size of their bodies, never able to turn around by the thousands in giant indoor facilities where they never see the light of day. Go online and, and watch. It's 12 minutes. Meet your meat. Uh, farm to fridge. All you have to do is type in farm to fridge, watch it, or meet your meat. You'll see what I'm talking about. People don't want to know. They want plausible, plausible deniability. That's what everybody wants. I don't want to know. I want to think of myself as a good person. Well, you know, once I saw this, I said, I have a moral obligation not to turn away. And that's what Tolstoy said. He said, you know, the instinct is when we see suffering to turn away and avoid it. But our moral obligation is to bear witness to it even if we can't do anything about it. On a psychic level, it helps to bear witness to the suffering. And so that's what we do. We go to, um, I go to uh, Farmer John's, which uh, makes the Dodger dogs, you know, that people wolf down yes, at the uh, sure. ball game. And they, oh, ha, ha, we have, let's have, let's see how many of these I can eat for a bar for all of those little contests. Well, we go and we bear witness to the pigs coming into Farmer John's to be slaughtered. And it's called L.A. Animal Save. And we try to give them water. And we say, we love you. We're sorry. And when you see an eye of one of those pigs going to their death, and then 15 minutes later, the truck comes out empty, and you can hear the squeals inside, it's life-changing, man. You can't can't pretend, mmm, bacon tasty. I mean, this is life and death. These animals have hearts. They had mothers. They have babies. They dream. Um, You know, it's just incomprehensible to me. The human species is very primitive. We're not very advanced. And, you know, Gandhi said, the mark of a civilization or how, how civilized a society is, is how it treats its animals. And Tolstoy said, you know, as long as there are slaughterhouses, there will be wars. So in my opinion, this is the most important social justice movement of all. In fact, I went to the Women's March representing animals. And I marched with a group oh, of animal wow. rights activists. Oh, yeah. that's cool. And, and I was right there. I got a guest pass. I was right in front of Gloria Steinem and um, Scarlett Johansson and Ashley Judd. And they were all giving their speeches. And, you know, uh, it was great. But it was sad that we couldn't expand the circle of compassion to all sentient beings. You know, um, that's what right. I would have liked to have seen. And, and Scarlett Johansson was there talking about, you know, compassion and she was wearing fur on her shoulders. And I screamed out, lose the fur. And, and people kind of look, <laughs> are, you know, look at me like, whose side are you Very on? I'm true. like, I- I'm side of, of all sentient beings. You know, that's selective indignation. Why don't right. we, what's, what's so demeaning about being kind to animals? You know, this false intelligentsia that the best and the brightest have. I had a lot of people who looked at me and kind of snickered at me or openly snickered at me. Because I cared about animals. Oh, isn't that nice? Oh, how oh how sweet. Oh, that's so cute. Like I was a child or, or somehow developmentally disabled because I cared about animals. The truth is that our treatment of animals is at the root of all of our societal problems. Climate change, meat production and dairy production is one of the leading causes of climate change beyond all transportation. The reason nobody talks about it is the media is beholden to the meat and dairy industry. That's why I'm doing what I'm doing on social media, because you're not going to get the truth in media, because they're responsible. To, they, 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 they don't want to alienate their advertisers. Those, those fast food commercials spend millions oh, of dollars. Yeah. They're not going to talk about how they're not going to talk about how processed meat is officially labeled by the World Health Organization cancer causing. So if you give your kid a nugget, why don't you just give them a cigarette, too, because it's the same thing. 
They're not going to talk about the fact that, oh, okay, the presidential debate was all about health care, right? Health care, health care, health care. Well, guess what? Nobody asked, why are people so sick? Why are two-thirds of Americans obese? Why are, are two-thirds of Americans overweight or obese? Why are Americans keeling over from heart disease? One in every four Americans dies from a heart attack, uh, heart-related wow. problems. That's cholesterol in their arteries clogging the blood flow to the heart. That's caused by plaque. Cholesterol only exists in animal products. But every time I try to mention this, I applaud you for letting me say this because I'm on TV, you know, still doing – I don't have my show on, on HLN anymore, and they were very kind to allow me to do animal segments every week. But any time right. I try to mention this when I'm a guest on a show, they shut me down. They, 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 really? they treat me like I'm crazy. Oh, yeah. No, because, see, it's all about game. Who's winning? Are the Democrats winning or are the Republicans winning? Are the liberals winning or are the conservatives winning? Meanwhile, we're all going to hell in a handbasket, okay? I mean, it, it's, it's, it's like this is a sporting, a sporting game that we've turned our civilization into. And we're, there's two teams. And, and if you're on one team, you know, you're rooting for, for this. And if you're on the other team, you're rooting for that. And that's not the solution. The solution is actually to look at the problems in a scientific way uh, and, and try to figure out how we could do something better. Healthcare, we can afford any kind of health care system we want, private, public, nationalized, privatized, if people weren't so damn sick. You know how expensive those stent operations are? They're $250,000. So people wow. are, are wildly sick, and, and our health care costs are skyrocketing, and the U.S. government makes us sick. Because they subsidize meat and dairy products. They subsidize the commodity crops like corn and wheat and uh, soybeans that go right into the farm animals. So the average hamburger would cost like $20 if the U.S. government didn't subsidize it. So it, the, whole, the whole problem is created by the government, and then they all argue about, oh, how are we going to solve it? And, it? and liberals and conservatives don't do anything about it. Nothing. And they know Michelle Obama knew. She knew. She tried to get the fruits and veggies, and they shut her down. They made her. They made her change it to let's move. Wow. About exercise. Well, it's it's uh it's something that more people should do. Um, if they had the uh, passion like you did, um, the message <laughs> would definitely get across stronger. And I salute you for uh sticking with your passion and I hope uh, you know someday it'll be you know much much better um, in terms of the uh, people eating meat and with the animals and everything you mentioned so well uh, I did want to talk to you about Madonna uh, she explained a little bit about what happened about her speech which was criminal if it was somebody else, but here's a little sound piece from this little talk. Madonna is walking back that shocking I comment that it. she wanted to blow up the White House. This is what she told the Women's March on Washington Saturday. Yes, I have thought an awful lot about blowing up the White House. But I know that this won't change anything. After a fury erupted, Madonna said it was just a metaphor. Fair. I am not a violent person. I do not promote violence. And it's important people hear and understand my speech in its entirety rather than one phrase. Courtesy of Inside Edition, James Velez, what's your thoughts on Madonna uh, doing what she did and then uh, coming back with an apology? Well, let me point out, Madonna was also wearing fur. <laughs> you know, uh, <laughs> the fish, now I'm going to use a species as metaphor. The, the fish stinks in the head, which, you know, is sad, but it's true. When you have somebody who's a president who has mocked disabled people, who has said things like, I could shoot somebody on Fifth Avenue and my fans wouldn't care, who um, lies, just lies. He's a He's, in my opinion, he's a pathological liar, and, and I'm not saying that as even an accusation. I've studied many criminals who are pathological liars, and he fits all the criteria that I can see. Uh, and, right. and basically, it's somebody who's colorblind to the truth. They just 
the truth is whatever works for them in that moment. Just like some people are colorblind, literally, and they can't distinguish between red and orange, well, there are certain people who cannot distinguish between truth and lies. Whatever comes out of their mouth at that instant is their truth, and that's why they're so believable. So I don't applaud with, uh, what, what uh, Madonna said. I think it was stupid because uh, I was there at the Women's March, and there were so many great speeches, and Gloria Steinem gave a great speech, and Michael Moore gave a great speech. She, I, you know, it's funny because I was waiting around. And then I left right, right before she started speaking because I just couldn't stand there anymore. I wanted to march, and I could hear the march. And um, there were so many great speeches. And, of course, you know, that's the one that ends up uh, getting all the coverage. Uh, it's sad because, boy, Gloria Steinem had some incredible things to say. And uh, there were so many other people who had really amazing things to say that were not violent. But, again, I mean, look at the times we're living in. We have a man who – says outright, you know, lies about people that, that could have repercussions, like saying, I watched thousands of people who cheered when the World Trade Center towers came down. It didn't happen. He didn't watch it because it never happened. That's a lie. That's not an untruth or alternate fact. It's an outright lie. When he says that, you know, I was in D.C. for the inauguration, and uh, right. the crowds were sparse. I'm not saying that because I'm not a fan of Donald Trump. They were sparse. My girlfriend and I went and bought subway tickets because we were afraid we wouldn't be able to get subway tickets. The subways were empty on Inauguration Day and the day before. And we actually had lunch at a vegan restaurant called Hip City Veg, and we saw the vendors leaving, (laughs) and they had all of their Donald Trump T-shirts and caps with them. It wasn't selling. It was very sparse. So for him to turn around and call the media liars because they show a photo – that proves that it was sparse. It's crazy. I mean, people, I, listen, my dad was a conservative Republican. There, there are Republicans that I might not agree with on every issue, but I respect them. I respect John McCain, you know, for example. Right. Um, and these, these people in Congress, in the House and the Senate, are going to have to stand up and start, you know, Speaking up for the truth, because the American people are going to catch on eventually that this guy is full of it, and he just says whatever yes. comes out of his mouth, and it means nothing. I mean, first he said, you know, well, one of my one of my top people that I that I nominated said, you know, waterboarding doesn't work. You can get more out of them with a cigarette and drink or whatever. And now he's like, torture works. You know, it's like, what's oh, it going to be tomorrow? You know. I was on Twitter, and they had a hashtag, thank you, Obama. And, you know, people, it was the last day uh, he was in office. And he said words to the effect of, you know, he wrote the hashtag, thank you, Obama, for being such a lousy president to make room for a great president like me. And I say to myself, how dumb could you be? Even if you feel that way inside, how do you say things like that that are going to spark so much people to want to do something very dangerous maybe to you it's just you know i mean it, it, we're in a very crazy time and it just it really reminds me of like the nixon era i was a young kid but i went to the fifth avenue peace parade marches on fifth avenue and it was you know obviously against the vietnam war and uh I remember it was what not 1972 he was reelected in a landslide and then watergate blew it up and he resigned but it's the same kind of energy I mean, we're seeing – it could end up being, you know, I'd like to be optimistic, a good thing, in that it's waking people up. It's waking up these post-feminist young women who think that they don't have to worry about politics. Oh, you know, when my mother was born in 1916, women did not have the right to vote. And that always sticks with me, uh, that, you know, we take so much for granted, but what has been given and what has been achieved can be taken away. And um, these folks would have no problem taking a lot away that women take for granted. Take a look at Iran, okay? Iran, yeah. um, you know, a horrible situation with the Shah, yes, but I knew a lot of Iranians who fled because my first job down in uh, Florida in 1977, I made fun, uh, friends with a bunch of Iranians who were, um, you know, in Fort Lauderdale, and we, frankly, we got parties. Good year. Very modern, <laughs> very modern women, you know, very <laughs> modern women, just – you know the idea that now they have to those same women of that age their their cousins or their 
you know, whatever daughters are back in Iran wearing scarves and can't can't go here and there and you know, I mean, can't drive in, in certain parts of the Middle East. We think that, oh yeah, we we've, we've got it. We don't have to worry about it. No. What can what has been accomplished can be taken away. And uh I just hope that women, young women, just get active and realize you know, it just it just baffles me that that 53 percent of white women voted for a Trump because he obviously has misogynistic tendencies. Anybody who says I can grab women by the bleep, I can't even repeat what the president said. And they let locker me do it talk. because I'm famous. Yeah, right. No, it's not locker room <laughs> talk. I, I, I mean, men don't talk like that. That's, that's I never not. spoke like that in high school. <laughs> In the yeah, locker room, I mean, we'll go to anything like that. That you're going to go up and grab some woman by the by the by the crotch because you can. I mean, think of the mentality. This is very frightening that that women overlook that. Why? Because they want to lower their taxes. Like he's going to lower the taxes for the average person. Give me a break. He's going to lower it for the point one percent and the one percent. I read a whole article about what's going to happen to healthcare. Listen, I'm. Again, I'm not necessarily a huge fan of Obamacare because I think he missed right. a big piece of the puzzle, which was making Americans healthy by cutting the at subsidies to bad food. But uh, <laughs> if you think your health care is expensive now, wait till the 0.1% and the 1% aren't subsidizing it anymore. Because if he cuts taxes for those upper income people, the middle income people, particularly the people who are independent contractors – um, who have to, you know, find their own insurance on the marketplace? That's the one. They're the ones that are going to see their health insurance skyrocket, or and or, uh, basically be useless, at, with with um, you know, uh, it's becoming very very difficult to find a doctor or caps on the spending. I mean, face it, you you really want do- uh, medical insurance for that that catastrophic horrible thing, you know, whether you get cancer or you get some tumor or you get something. That's when you need to have insurance. You know, we could all pay to, 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 you know, whatever, fix our colds. Well, not that you can fix a cold, but to go there and get, you know, a, a Z pack. It's when you get really seriously ill. That's when you need your insurance. And that's what they're going to end up having to put a cap on. Because yeah. it has yeah. to be subsidized. The average person can't afford that. No, you make uh, a, a lot of uh, definitely good points. Um, before we get to the uh, final story, uh, now I have the uh, attorney for uh, Jody coming up next week. With that in mind, I did buy your book uh, a couple of years ago, and it is a great insight into the Jody Arias case. Would you please tell my audience about it and how they can obtain it? Okay, it's called Exposed, The Secret Life of Jody Arias. And you can get it on Amazon by just going to Amazon. I, by the way, uh, joined Amazon Smile, and I every time I buy something off of Amazon, a percentage goes to PETA. So you can sign up for oh, yeah. uh, a group like PETA so that a percentage can go every time you buy something. So Exposed is the story of Jody Arias, who was a pathological liar. Again, that's one of the reasons why I know the hallmarks, because I've studied them. And she was a classic pathological liar. One of the things that pathological liars do, and Jody did, they always take a bit of the truth and they embellish right. it. So, you know, she would take something that happened, like the two of them had sex, and maybe it was kinky sex because it, it, it was a very kinky story. There's a lot of triple X rated material in my book, not because I'm into that sort of thing, but because that's what they engaged in. Uh, and instead of her being the seducer and the one who had the sexual experience and who had been around the block and who started the kinky games, it suddenly morphed into the same sex uh, encounter, but that she was being sexually violated and abused and degraded and yeah. demeaned. That's a classic pathological liar. They take the situation and they rework it to make it come out completely different. And she does this over and over again. She was on the witness stand for 18 days. Remember, she stabbed Travis Alexander something like 29 times, split his throat. And Um, it was like three weeks worth. It wasn't just 18 days. It was like a month on TV, right? (laughs) 
<laughs> oh my god. I mean, it, it just never ended. And it was just one lie after the next, all painting herself as the victim. You know, the other thing about pathological liars and malignant narcissists, which she is, and so are some other people, um, they, at the end of the day, don't really care if they get positive attention or negative attention. It's just attention that they want. In their reptilian brain, they're not alive unless they're getting attention. So it's better if it's good attention, but I'll take bad attention too. Better than no attention at all. And so these are the kinds of hallmarks of sociopathic behavior that we have to look out for in today's very crazy world because... Sort of um, like the BTK uh, killer. They said that about him, that he was mostly after uh, attention. You know, he liked doing what he did, obviously, but attention was what he was seeking out um, from a lot of things I read. I didn't, you yeah, know, or power. The, uh, I mean, I crowd, think in but... his case, it was a very powerless person who was seeking to have some kind of power in his life over other people. But, uh, yeah. But um, um, back to Jody. What do you think of the mother? Because the apple to me didn't far, uh, uh, you know, far from the truth because she, after the uh, trial, she, she was, like, saying, words the effect of, it's so sad that I'll never get to see my daughter Jody walk down that aisle. Something I always and and I do believe her. You know, do you think that she's denial or she's a little narcissist or a combination? No, mother. no. She the the mother is has nothing to do with this. I mean, she may have been on the cold side. That's pretty much it. She did not abuse. I talked to Jody Harris's best friend from childhood at length, and she's oh, okay. in the book. And they, you know, she threw her parents under the bus, and, she, and her friend said she never saw any evidence of beatings. Her mother was very strict, and her father was very strict, and that they were a little too strict. So I think, you know, it's just about things being out of balance. Um, but I think Jody had mental problems from the get-go, and I think every mother always says that. They, you know, at every single criminal trial, the last person standing behind the defendant is always mommy. You know, uh, that's just the way it goes. And I don't even blame the parents. I mean, that's just a mother, whether it's a mama pig, a mama cow, um, or a mama human, will always want to be with their baby and always want to protect their baby no matter what. Which was more crazy, uh, the trial for you to cover in terms of Jody Arias or Casey Anthony? Because I know you covered both of those A to Z, wire to wire. Oh, they were different. I mean, I think Jody Aries sticks with me because A, I wrote a book on it, and B, it was more recent. But I do feel Jody took a page from Casey. I mean, Casey threw her parents under the bus big time, accused her dad of being, you know, a pervert, molesting her, and accused yes. um, her mother of, you know, accused her brother. And Jody took a page from that and threw her whole family under the bus, you know. But, I mean, uh God, they were both crazy in their own ways. Um, I, I just, I think it's a draw. To be honest with you, I'm going to give them a tie. That's a good, that's a good answer. <laughs> that, 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 uh, <laughs> two interesting people. I mean, especially the way it ended, though. The case ended you know, on a hot July. Uh, I see a text. Uh, not guilty. When you saw that, uh, oh, case yeah. Anthony, what did you say to yourself? Did you react to I, Okay, I have to YouTube? say, and I'm not, <laughs> I'm not rewriting history, but I always said that I thought that the prosecution didn't do as good a job. Overcharged. You know, no, it, not overcharged. They just didn't do a good job. They kept talking about, where's Kaylee? Where's Kaylee? Well, uh, Jose Baez pulled the rug right out from under them with his first line. Kaylee was dead all along. There was no kidnapping there. You know, he, they, they focused so much on our lying. Uh, again, another pathological liar. Liars are very dangerous people. Just I don't care what your party affiliation is, but just remember that. Casey Anthony is a pathological liar, famously, infamously. Jody Arias is a pathological liar. Most criminals are pathological liars. I mean, to a large degree. Yeah. I'm not talking OJ about crime passion, but Yeah, exactly. OJ. So be careful with a pathological liar. It's going to bite you yes, big time. Yes, never know. That's yeah, a very um, good point. Final thing. Well, listen. Um, I, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I was just going to think that with the uh, protest for Donald Trump 
you know, it has gotten nasty. Before we let you go, uh, give me your take on uh, some of the rioting uh, that's been gone going on uh, since he okay. was uh, uh, yeah. came it, president. It, then we'll it was call a, it a night. small group, a relatively small group of people, okay, anarchists who did their very ill-advised window smashing um, the night, I believe it was the night before the inauguration. The Women's March itself, there were no arrests. It was the right. largest turnout of people en masse ever, okay, dwarfing the anti-war protests of the 60s. It's estimated one out of every 100 people in America attended those protests. Um, there were no arrests. Okay, so let's not single out, you know, a handful of anarchists and try to tie them to the people who are protesting Donald Trump for his craziness. And um, I think we have to separate those two. And that's kind of like what the what right wing media does. You know, the right wing media has a tendency to take just those anarchists. Forget about the one in 100 people who, who protest every city in the United States and globally. Let's just talk about, you know, the 25 people or however many it was that threw rocks and broke windows. So uh, let's not let's not worry about that. Seriously. Um, on every side, there's extremists, and we have to leave that out of the equation. But um, I want to say thank you. I think they're voting in there. Yes, tell everybody your website and everything yes. to get in contact uh, with you. Before sure, you janeunchained.com, or you could go to janebelezmitchell.com or janebelezmitchell.org. But a lot of my videos are seen, like you could watch what's happening now live, facebook.com slash janebelezmitchell. Go to the official site. And um, you can watch all my content there. And uh, I'm at JVM on Twitter. So thank you so much. This was so much fun. And I'm, um, I'm glad we Please had come back. to talk. Okay, I Please will. Please come back, Jane. Okay. okay. You have a good weekend. And bye, bye. Uh, keep, keep doing what you're doing. Thank okay, you, Okay, ladies and gentlemen, that bye. was – have a good one. Okay, that was uh, Jane Velez Mitchell. Uh, check her out on janeunchained.com. Uh, a wonderful guest, uh, indeed. Um, I thought it was very interesting, and I think you definitely should check out that book. Also, uh, uh, next week we'll have the attorney, Jody Arias. Kirk Nermy joins us again, and uh, we'll try to figure out what happened with him and that story of him being disbarred. We'll get into that. Also, I want to give a shout-out to Maddie for uh, reposting everything, and uh, whoever else did, I really appreciate it. Uh, also, you could follow me at Twitter, at KingJordanRAD, and uh, that's the story with that. So, uh, like I said, next th- uh, Thursday is Nermi, and then I also have booked, if you haven't heard already, Joey Jackson will join us um, on the 23rd of February. So definitely uh, we look forward to having Joe, uh, Joey at all times. Tonight we'll leave you with the Vichys on a throwback Thursday. Good night, everybody.